Hey, Buddy Whittington with the Texas Scratch Project on Border City Rock Talk with Ernest Skinner. This is a tune of mine called Texas Trios. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to Border City Rock Talk. You get great news, great interviews, great interviewees, sometimes a comedic touch. This is probably my last interview before the holiday season. So uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Festivus for the rest of us. And um, um, yeah, just uh, warm wishes from me to you. Uh, hit the like button and subscribe oh, to the yeah. channel if you haven't. Today I've got a blues legend for you, Buddy Whittington. How you doing, buddy? I'm okay. I don't. I don't believe I would go that far but with the legend business. I'm. I'm more of a leg end than I am a legend. <laughs> well, people just recently saw the intro uh, guitar um, uh, piece you did, uh, Texas Trios. I'm pretty sure they're going to think you're in the legendary category. Uh, anyways, you're you're best known for your blues playing, but um, it would be with uh, John Mayall and the Blues Breakers, but. Today we're here to talk about, um, and I just recently saw something, it's a re-release or a unreleased, released or whatever. It's like, it's about 10 or 12 years in the making with um, a project called Texas Hold'em. Isn't that right? Well, that's, cl that's close, but uh, you got to have have more cards than, than you do for, uh, for Texas Hold'em to play Texas Scratch. Texas Scratch. I'm just kidding. I'm going to have to uh, talk to that uh, assistant of mine. Oh, speaking of uh, somebody I would like to thank is John Lavin for getting me this interview with you. So give the uh, viewer and um, your fans um, a bit of a history lesson on how this Texas Scratch project uh, finally came to fruition and how it's about 12 years in the making. I think it's more like 14. I believe we, we Jim Suler and I jumped in his van and drove from Dallas to Dover, New Jersey. In, in 2009 and uh, drove straight to the Showplace studio where Vince Converse was already up there in progress writing a couple of tunes and uh, had, had a, I think he had a couple written for the project and he was working with Ben Elliott who has since passed on, I sad to say. But we had a wonderful time up there doing it and it took us, oh, maybe four and a half days just to get the, the basics down. We did, you know, it wasn't any, it wasn't like we were going in recording Fleetwood Max rumors or anything, you know. Right. We just got in there and got it done in a hurry and came back home. And then Jim uh, went to the studio in Dallas and added some some Hammond parts and a couple of vocal, background vocal parts and things that just to spice it up a little bit. But uh, it wound up, the first label that we were on with it, wound up not not doing anything with it for like you say 14 years and and it uh it seemed like every time we we get work okay the record's coming out let's get ready for it we're gonna go out and play some gigs and you know and then it, well it'll be coming out next september well it'll be coming out in january you know and nothing really ever happened with it until uh Porto valley purchased the album and uh, and put it out and they've really died i must say you know what i have i haven't had a whole lot of you know, dealings with record companies, but Cordo Valley has done a wonderful job of uh, getting the word out about it, which we're really happy about. Um, how many tracks are on the album? I know it was released digitally on, was it June 2nd? Uh, you know, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I was thinking that, I, I was thinking it was September that it was actually released. Maybe that was a CD, but uh, but I, I'm not sure when it came out. And, I, and and actually, without having to go look on the album, I don't know how many tracks are on there either. 
I think I, I was uh, responsible for a couple of my originals. And then I put in one uh, by a guy named John Nitzinger here in Texas that, uh, that he's always been a big hero to a lot of us guitar players coming up and uh, had, had some great uh, success with an album called Nitzinger, N-I-T-Z-I-N-G-E-R back in 72 and, and through, you know, 1985 or whatever. He's a, uh, He's still he's still with us. His health is not really great, but uh, we we talk to him and we still everybody still reveres the guy for his talent and playing and everything. Uh, give the viewers um, that are tuning in here um, a bit of um, um, of overview of who's in the band and um, how let's say George Thorogood and the Destroyers fit into the picture. Well, Jim Suler and Jeff Simon both have been playing with with uh, George Thorogood for Jim's been in there. I think. 30 years i think or something like that 25 or 30 and jeff simon the drummer has been in there since the beginning which was way back in the 70s and uh uh it's still with them they still tour quite a lot and uh like i say this just the, this album just took took place or the recording of took place during their time off and uh i think i had uh I had just been, I just got my walking papers from the Blues Breakers because John decided to revamp everything and start over, you know, with another uh, another round of, of musicians. But uh, it worked out real good because the timing was good if we would have just got the album out in time. But, but we're, we're happy with it now because we know we're with a good company and it's uh, it's a lot's being done with it. Right. I, I have heard a few songs other than Texas Trios, and it's a very good album. Um, so you're saying three of the members are with the Destroyers? Well, just just uh, Jeff and, and Jim and Nathaniel, the bass player. I, I met him when he was playing with Kim Simmons and Savoy Brown and uh, mm. back when he was with them for a while. Now Kim and, and Nathaniel have both passed on, so... Mm -hmm. You know, we're we're just we're gonna have to do be creative and get the we we me Jim and I have played a couple of gigs with it already with the Texas Scratch stuff already. Uh, we haven't been able to do it with Vince yet because he lives in Denver and we're in the DFW area, and we're planning on doing that as soon as we can. You know, get everybody together and and get somebody to get some dates together for us. Right. What I was kind of getting at, buddy, was. If you had two fifths of the band or three fifths, I would say, you know what? It could be Texas Buddy and the Destroyers. <laughs> I don't know how well that would go over. No, but, I love uh, Texas Scratch. That's a great uh, name, and actually, I love the album cover. That's um, I'm pretty sure there's a few guys out there that have the Texas State uh, outline as a guitar. Um, do you guys actually have one of those or is that what no I don't have one I, it seems like Ray Wiley Hubbard used to have one like that and there, there, there's a few telecasters around that have been you know messed with and uh, sawed out and everything when somebody took a bandsaw to a telecaster and tried to make Texas out of it it's a great idea but it's it's not unique I think it's been done now um, when you were playing your guitar I see uh, that your guitar you're not one of those um, pretentious kind of a commercial guy's got to have a pretty guitar. You have a rough and cut guitar. It's got chips all over it, which is awesome. It's raw. What kind of guitar is that? Uh, the one, let's see, the one you saw, I think, would probably be my uh, 63 Strat. It, it was a 63 Fender Stratocaster to start with, but it's become kind of like Johnny Cash's Cadillac because I've got, uh, I've made repairs on it as I wear the pieces out. Like I've had a neck. Scott Lentz out in uh, uh, California built me a new neck, which I will always be thankful about. I need to get him to build me another one. And uh, I have uh, had a couple of the pickups rewound. I've still got the original pickups, but they have been rewound. New, you know, volume pot here and there, new frets here and there. But I'm I'm about out of rosewood on the, on the uh, fingerboard, so I'm going to have to have a new neck before too long. I've got some pretty ones, but they don't sound as good as that one. Yeah, I mean, the type... Try tested and sure no that uh, that's that's nice and raw. Now, um, what kind of what do you use for kind of a tone? What's your go to? Because I don't think there's too many effects in the amp coming on. What amp are you using? Well, on on the thing on the video I sent you, I'm pretty sure that I was just using a little amp I use around the house. But I, I all my playing years since 1995, I've used a Dr. Z amp, uh, be it one of his. Uh, Maz, his 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 answer named after his kids' initials, 
I think my dad's is Michael Anthony Zaty is his son's name. And I had a 38 watt and I use an 18 watt more now because the 38 is too loud to play anywhere, you know, unless you're in a really big place. And I've got one called a Z Lux and I've got one called a Route 66. And a, I've got several of his uh, offerings and it's really good stuff. He's been really great helping me out over the years. No, I mean, that, it just, it sounded, it sounded great by the way. And uh, your bends and everything, it was just amazing. Um, who influenced you um, in your style, per se? I know that's a cliche huh. question, and I promise not to ask them, but uh, I'm sure the viewers want to know. I have to say, I saw ZZ Top in 1972, and, and the early, real ZZ Top, before the beards and before the, you know, all the, the, the computer stuff in the, in the, and the music came in. That was the real stuff for me. It just knocked me out. And uh, and like many other guys that, that I grew up with down here, we all revere those guys. And like I say, John Nitzinger, he was another guy, a guy named Bugs Henderson from from Dallas, actually from Tyler, Texas. He was another hero of mine. And there there were a lot of country guys too growing up. You know, Eldon Shamblin with uh, with Bob Wills, Texas Playboys, and Don Rich with Buck Owens, Roy Nichols with Merle Haggard. I, I've listened to all of them, and I, I don't know if it comes through in my playing, but there's a little bit of that in there, you know. As uh, Adrian Vandenberg told me once, um, every guitar player he listened to growing up kind of left a mark. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. One way or, one way or another. I mean, it's not like you're going to go out and, and just, like, take everything they've got, but – yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes you think about the way you're going to play something or what, you know, what kind yeah. of. And some of it's conscious and some of it's subconscious. And I think the subconscious part is the best. That's uh, right. So are you guys uh, planning on doing any shows uh, in the new year or you're just waiting to see what happens? Because I Well, I we, would like, we would really like to get together and do a tour of, of some kind. Uh, like I say, me and Jim have done a couple of small shows to start with and just get things growing a little bit. And uh, we'd like to get Jeff involved, you know, to play drums. And the, la the last couple that we did, I had my the, the bass player that I work with on my local gigs down here in Texas, Wayne Six, playing bass with us. So he may wind up doing that. And uh, we, you know, like I say, we and, and, and some of the songs he added some Hammond parts. So uh, Sean uh, uh, Ferris, Jim's keyboard player in his band, might join us on some of that. Hope so. Anyway, sounds real good. Perfect. Uh, before I let you go, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you to tell the viewers about the Gary Moore um, kind of story or influence and how you shared the stage with Gary Moore. Well, it, it, he became a friend of, of all the blues breakers and John Mayall because when we would tour, we toured the U UK a couple of times a year usually. And uh, when we played down around Brighton, which was where Gary lived, he lived in a little village called Hove down there. And uh, he would always come see us at the Brighton Dome when we played down there and uh, sit in with us. He, he was there one night with no guitar, and he had to, he called a taxi to go to his house and pick up a guitar and bring it back. I only had one with me. I mean, I only ever took one with me on the road because of the, you know, the Spartanness of the way we had to tour, you know. So I, he could have used one of mine, but I only had one with me. So he had a taxi driver go to his house and get his Les Paul and bring it back over. <laughs> and... Uh, he, he was always, always very, you know, he, pleasant guy to deal with and uh, asked me to get a, a trio together and come out like maybe, maybe not quite a Texas trio, but we had a trio and went out and were the opener on his next to the last UK tour. And we did uh, a string of dates across the UK and uh, had a great time. He got me up on stage with his band and I got to play with a lot of people and for a lot of people that I probably wouldn't have had a chance to otherwise. Right on. Um, before I let you go, um, well, I'm going to let everybody know right now that um, just check in the description box. I'll leave links to where you can um, purchase the album, Texas Scratch, and I'll even leave a link there with, uh, uh, I think I saw the, the YouTube video with Gary uh, Moore playing with uh, Buddy here. Um, favorite Canadian band or artist, uh, Buddy, do you have one? I used to listen to Triumph a little bit. Back Triumph when is they, big these days. I'm getting a lot of people uh, telling me that, actually. Yeah, Rick Emmett, for sure. Yeah, you know, they they, they play, they got a lot of airplay here. Uh, when they're well, That's where they broke. Oh, really? Yeah, actually, it's a funny, well, it's not a funny story. It's, it's a unique story. 
they got their big break. There was a there's a certain radio station. I don't know if it was in Houston or Dallas that would play um, you know harder rock from bands that weren't necessarily signed, and they actually got their break because this 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 radio personality kept playing Triumph music over and over because I don't know where he heard it from, but that's where Triumph actually got their big break was in Texas. How about that? Probably Redbeard on Q102 or LaBella. It was Q something, so it wouldn't be, I wouldn't doubt it, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, they, you know, they, they were quite big here, you know, at, at a, a long time ago. Another guy that, that I'm always interested to hear something from is a great guitar player named Amos Garrett, who's probably most... Uh, Famously played the solo on uh, Mario Moldar's Midnight at the Oasis. He's just a fabulous guitar player. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, last uh, question here, buddy. I know that you're busy. Um, I've got uh, the elves behind me telling me uh, I've got things to uh, wrap and everything. Yeah, that's a nice touch, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, they just came home from college. No, they're not my <laughs> kids, obviously. Uh, what's the opposite of unsubscribe? Subscribe. Hit that, everybody, hit that button and subscribe. That's right. Everybody do as uh, I am going to say, the legend Buddy Whittington says, and subscribe to the channel for these great interviews, great news, and sometimes a comedic touch in the new year. I've got some big, big interviews coming up, and I'm talking huge. Even so, um, everybody stick around, and thanks again, Buddy, for your time, my friend. Thanks for having me. I sure appreciate it. Thank you.